are now rolling again and we're in after dark mode and uh, something you uh, might notice right now is that Gareth is awfully quiet. In fact, he is not here. He had to, uh, to depart. Uh, or jet off, as he says. Yeah, in an untimely fashion. But he says that he trusts us to do this. And I, as I noted, it was his first mistake. Uh, we'll yes. get back to that. Uh, well, actually, it was uh, in a series of mistakes that he's made. That this is, you know, because he, you know, hosts us. He agreed to be on the show. Uh, so it's, it, you know, down the line, this probably is his six hundredth, maybe six hundred and fifteenth mistake. I it's know. up to his usual standards. Yeah. <laughs> But so, um, there were a couple of examples that I think that we both thought up uh, prior to the episode and uh, during that we didn't get to bring up. And I'm going to uh, start with you, because at the tail end of the episode, you mentioned interlaced video. So uh, please do give me your best rant about that, my good friend. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, we were talking about uh, when you try to push uh, technology. And uh, Gareth uh, was talking about uh, when CD-ROMs came into the limelight and uh, basically, again, the whole 10-year-old uh, in the liquor cabinet kind of thing, uh, people just went overboard. So this this is when, of course, we get uh, games that take up uh, four, five, six, sometimes seven, in one case, eight CD-ROMs, Black Dahlia, for instance, and, uh, and they... Uh, developers quickly noticed that even though they had all this space to play with and they were now shipping on you know eight cd roms still the video compression and uh, you know fitting all of this uh, you know full motion video onto cds was actually becoming kind kind of a challenge uh so what they did was that they would compress the hell out of these videos not only to make them fit onto the cds of course but also because computers back in the day were not really powerful enough to you know when we when we sit down and watch a movie that we've uh, you know you know on Netflix in HD ten eighty p and such mm. uh, or um, or four K even yeah four K and and such uh, you know our computers can handle that but uh, you know the good old four eighty sixes and Pentiums of the of the nineties couldn't uh, so they would uh, they would make these videos in very very low resolutions um, like uh, three twenty by two forty or something like that and. Um, if you're running a game in SVGA resolution, and we're thinking, of course, of you know games like uh, Under a Killing Moon uh, or uh, the Pandora Directive, which did not use interlaced video, uh, but you've got games like Gabriel Knight 2 and... Um, Overseer uh, did as well. The, the CD-ROM version of Overseer Mind. Yes, that is true. Uh, what they would do was that they would upscale the video, uh, but then to prevent... Um, you know, a, a lot of artifacting, and also to, uh, you know, again, ease off on the CPU, they would alternate um, each each scan line of the video would be completely black. So you'd get these Venetian blinds effect uh, over the video. And, uh, you know, in, you know, from a technological standpoint, it makes sense because uh, you took uh, you took you took some load off the CPU, you took some load off the CD-ROM, which had to stream the video. Um, it would only need to you know display half of the content that it would normally do. But what it also did was give you a massive headache because uh, after you know playing Gabriel Knight for four hours straight, you literally start seeing scan lines everywhere you look. Oh yeah, yeah, and you think you might have developed glaucoma or some sort of uh, neurological <laughs> yeah. disease. Yeah, exactly. So, so interlaced video uh, again. It's kind of a product of the time, and again, it was kind of a, a slapdash uh, solution to a problem that they probably didn't foresee. But uh, you have some games um, that where, where you where you can't actually turn off the scan lines. Uh, Gabriel Knight Two, uh, Toonstruck, for instance. There is no way to get in uh, the settings if, if your computer is powerful enough and your uh, uh, cd-rom drive is fast enough you can't you still can't turn it off um uh, they actually had to release uh, fan-made patches for gabriel knight 2 to um, remove oh, yeah. the scan lines well it's kind of um, this idea that people will want to run the game at a higher resolution at the cost of basically everything and i think that it's a bit of a shame that people think like that because some something i used to do and i know this is not an adventure game i used to have a red alert on CD, you know, the Westwood Command and Conquer game, and it oh, came yeah. with a Windows Windows version, and it came with a DOS version. Obviously, the DOS version would run at a lower resolution. That also meant, however, that you lost the scan lines, and that was the version I preferred, even though the interface was that more cumbersome, because I think the Windows version ran at SVGA uh, resolution, or it was 800 by 600. I don't really remember. Whereas the DOS version was VGA, 
So the space that you played in, in DOS, was smaller, but you really got that much more of a kick out of the video because everything wasn't shrouded in darkness because of the scan lines. Exactly. And there were, there were other sort of workarounds that uh, some people tried. We mentioned uh, briefly Ripper with uh, Christopher Walken, which I still maintain is a fantastic performance by the guy, but <laughs> let's not go there. Um, what, what Ripper did in order to play full motion video was that every time it had to play an FMV, it would switch resolutions on you. The game itself... Oh, yeah, when, a few games do yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, when, when, you're, when you're actually looking around rooms and maneuvering and solving puzzles and such, the game runs in 640x480 SVGA. But every time it plays a video, it uh, jumps down to 320x200 or 320x240. I don't that's know. That's also a bit of a disturbance in the gameplay, though, because that kind of looks like your computer's breaking. I mean, if you remember back in the day on Windows 95 and the like, when you switched resolutions, it looked like your monitor was exploding. Yeah, it, it looked like it was having a bit of a seizure there. And uh, some video cards would do this on the fly and you wouldn't really notice. And some video cards would, you know, uh, literally the first uh, couple of seconds of the video would just be completely shrouded in blackness because yeah. the video card was still having an aneurysm. Uh, I'm really trying! <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> And and again, there was there was nothing in the options uh, to tell the game. Look, uh, my computer can actually do this. Uh, let's uh, let's try it for something different. Now, on the flip side of all of this, we've got a game like The Eleventh Hour, which uh, came out uh, very very late in the DOS era. Actually, it uh, it was so delayed that when it came out, people weren't actually really using DOS to play games anymore. Right. It uh, and uh, what what it did have, however, was as uh, to the best of my recollection, it's the first game that had 32-bit uh, color. Um, you could you could play it in 8-bit color, which was uh, atrocious. Uh, you could play it in 16-bit color, which was a bit nicer, and then you could play it in 32-bit color. Um, the game, however, the game itself and the video engine, um, you could enable interlacing. You could uh, de-enable it. What is it? Disable, of course. Yeah, um, yeah all right. You could have it play in a window, which was uh, really uh, completely useless. Um, I, I never got why people do that, playing in windows. It's like, could I ruin my suspension of disbelief anymore? <laughs> no, let's... Oh. Okay, here's Gabriel Knight. It's got this great immersive story, but I'm going to treat it like it's solitaire. <laughs> Idiots. Actually, uh, side note, uh, some games did do that. Like when they were playing a, a video or a cutscene, the, uh, the the screen resolution would sort of get smaller. Gabriel Knight actually did that. When it's playing, uh, when it's playing these animations, oh, that's um, true. That's true. The, the screen sort of gets uh, gets smaller. Um, uh, uh, Under a Killing Moon notoriously has wildly varying screen resolutions depending on what movie is playing. Isn't the <laughs> intro of the Pandora Directive also kind of on a small area because it's a very long intro? Yeah, uh, Pandora Directive streamlined it. Uh, all the all the videos, like when it goes full screen and it plays a video, um, it's uh, you know uh, the interface disappears and there's black bars everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but at least in, in Pandora Directive, they kind of they stuck to the same resolution. In Under Killing Moon, it goes from like postage stamp size to uh, complete full, uh, you know, fill the oh, screen yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's right. It's really disconcerting, and and, and every step in, in between. Um, uh, what the hell? Oh yeah, eleventh hour. Um, the thing that Eleventh Hour did not take into account was um, was the the speed of your computer. It wouldn't, you know, go in and say, "Well, you did select thirty two bit color, but you do know you're running a three eighty six, so fuck you." It would it would merrily chuck along and try to play these videos at whatever resolution you told <laughs> it to, um, and it would not it would not compensate in the slightest way. So if your computer was not quite up to scratch and you were playing Eleventh Hour in thirty two bit color SVGA. Um, the videos would appear to run in slow motion. It would just it would display the data it got off the CD in whatever order it came in. <laughs> One frame per second, something like that. Yeah, and the audio would do the same thing. That's a nice segue, actually. Uh, now that you're mentioning audio, because that uh, leads me to bring up the example that I thought uh, of at the very tail end of the episode itself, which is something I know is kind of also a pet peeve of yours. Loom, because Loom is kind of like the talky version of Loom is this double-edged sword where you have great performances from everyone. You have excellent fidelity because it's playing off a Redbook CD, so it's uncompressed uh, 44.1 kilohertz 16-bit PCM audio. 
On the other hand, what you do lose is you lose a lot on the script in order to make all the voices fit on the CD. And that's kind of... That really is a shame because Loom, a short game as it is, it's, it creates this wonderfully unique universe that Brian Moriarty came up with. And you lose so much information on the CD version that you could argue that it's not even worth it to, to, mm -hmm. to have the voices at all. And you lose so much of the wonderful Tchaikovsky music because you know, the, there is no looping music. It can only play whenever there's a cutscene with voices going on. Exactly. You're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, a Loom CD is a pet peeve of mine, even though, like you say, the performances are great. This was an example of early CD-ROM technology where they just hadn't figured out the whole stream from the CD bit. Because when you play like Day of the Tentacle or Fate of Atlantis, all the speech is uh, streaming off the CD. Yeah. Uh, so you can play uh, yeah, so, so you, you can play MIDI music and you can play digital uh, sound. Actually, your sound card is doing all the work. It but is. In, but in Loom... Uh, like you say, it, it's it's streaming off the the CD like like uh, um, like like Red Book Auto. Like you can pop that into your stereo and and listen to the audio tracks. Yeah, but skip track one though. All, oh yeah, and that, that yeah, nineties kit lesson number one. Always <laughs> skip track one. Jesus, oh, yeah, that indeed. thing could damage your speakers. And and what's interesting, you you mentioned sound fidelity was that uh, you know they they had. A good idea, which was to give this uh, the best possible audio that they could. This is uncompressed, uh, fantastic CD quality uh, audio. And then you go like two years down the line, I think, and you get Day of the Tentacle on CD-ROM, and it's 22 kilohertz, 16-bit uh, uh, mono sound, as mm. far as I but uh, certainly remember. good enough for what they were doing with that game. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, the voices are still quite uh, high fidelity. Uh, now let's let's contrast this for for an interesting little tidbit. Um, you get a game like uh, Day of the Tentacle, which takes up, I believe, uh, around two hundred fifty megabytes on the CD. That, uh, that was a lot back then, though. That was a lot. Like they they got better at filling out the space. Those early CDs were notoriously physically heavy to hold. Oh yeah, I mean, and and it, it's it's still a way up to uh, you know the six hundred and seventy megabytes that's on the CD. No, six forty. I can't remember. Six uh, some, something. Six hundred something. Seven hundred um, if you're over burning and squeezing the shit out of the poor thing. Oh yeah, but they they didn't do that. Let let's just say like uh, like six hundred and forty megabytes, and uh, Dave the Tentacle is uh, around two hundred and fifty megabytes. Yeah. Uh, co contrast that to uh, Beneath the Steel Sky, my, one of my favorite games, uh, which comes on CD-ROM with full uh, voiceover. It is. Are you ready for this? Yes. Seventy-four megabytes. Oh well, the, the fidelity in Beneath the Steel Sky isn't very good. I think I, I do I do love the performances in that game because it's also passionate uh but uh but yeah uh, the fidelity yeah. is not too great it is it is atrocious and i i really I, i'm a scratching my head here because why would you first of all you've got all this space why would you compress so much out of the audio uh if you've got 640 megabytes to play with and your entire game with art and animation and sound effects and voices and everything you can squeeze in and it still only comes to about 74 megabytes now here's the kicker I, I I heard somewhere that Revolution actually still have the original DAT tapes that the voices were recorded onto. Ooh. And, I wonder uh, why they didn't use that when they did a they did a remastered version, of course, which was uh, iOS and maybe Android exclusive. I do have it on my iPhone actually. No, but they, only but, iPhone. But as far as I can uh, I can tell, they do use the original uh, in-game audio as opposed yes. to newly cut off the dead tapes no uh they they still use the old audio uh that is true and uh i, I mean it may just be a rumor maybe th maybe there are some of the dead tapes missing so they could only do partially uh you know the full soundtrack maybe they just couldn't be fucked i don't know uh but yeah um <laughs> 74 megabytes and then here's another kicker uh which is kind of uh, uh not well I was going to say lazy. Uh, yeah, it's, and, it's, and let's let lazy. let's uh, you you get the last kicker because we're nearing uh, fifteen minutes here. All right, um, you, you get you get one more after this one, and then I'll just I'm, I'm just going to pack it in. Uh, Broken Sword gets uh, re-released, and it gets re-released in a director's cut thing, and it gets released for everything like PC, Mac, Wii, uh, mm. iOS, everything. Of all the things. 
yeah with uh, with added uh, content you got these uh, in my opinion quite meaningless uh, opening sequences with nico and yeah. of course they have they have to get an actress in to read nico's lines because this stuff wasn't in the original game so they have to do, uh, do brand new voiceovers the brand new voiceovers are in fantastic high fidelity quality because this game came out what uh, oh, like oh i know what you're going to say yeah the rest of the game however the original game uh, once you get to george stobart's bit in paris and all the way up to the end is uh, the same abysmal, uh, I think even this was 8-bit, um, you know, it's really basically, abysmal sample. Yeah, it, it basically sounds like something Thomas Edison recorded on a wax cylinder. Yes, it is. Uh, and, and, and it's they kind of did the same thing with Beneath the Steel Sky. The, the, the sound quality is like uh, like 14 kilohertz, 8-bit uh, something. And uh, and Broken Sword was, was slightly better, but not really. And uh, you can... Cl- Clearly, hear the difference between this high-quality uh, Nico bit and then the rest of the game is just yeah. this awful sound quality. Now they get a free pass because uh, the dat tapes for the original recordings in Broken Sword are nowhere to be found, uh, but Beneath the Steel Sky apparently are. So um, yeah, well, gotta Beneath wonder about the Steel that. Sky apparently gets maligned. Everyone is talking about uh, Broken Sword, but I could never get into it. it. It just moves so slowly that I lose all interest. Whereas you know, I do have points of criticism about Beneath a Steel Sky, but I vastly prefer it. Mm, yeah, me too. Okay, so you you get one. I'm not I'm not sure I have one any. To me, that this was just all about wrapping up the episode with some additional points about audio and video that we didn't get to bring up. But I think I've uh, over the course of the past few hours, I've uh, made my points. I believe. Oh yeah. Okay. So so if we if we're gonna take this uh, to the design level, like uh, now you have limitless options and such. I think the, um, the 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 thing to take away from this, if you are developing a game, is to know your limitations and not you know uh, push boundaries just because you can. Just make sure that the game is actually enjoyable. If you're trying something new, then at least show it to another person and have them give you the honest opinion of whether this works or not before, yeah. <laughs> before you shove it out the door. Or, you, you, you know, you should always distinguish uh, the limitations of the technology to your limitations. That's also what I think you're, you're getting at here, because the limitations of what the computer uh, will do is not necessarily the same as what you think it will do. No, in in my mind, uh, the limitation is: Does this work to tell the story? Are you actually mm. putting this shit in because it sounds fancy, or because it actually works? I mean, um, uh, Francisco Gonzalez will uh, gladly tell you the story of how he almost put a driving simulator into a golden wake, and then realized, why am I doing this? Yeah. It did. It didn't work for Police Quest. Why would it work for me? Because it's to the detriment. Well, I find that few people do that these days, though, and that's also kind of a shame. But this is really something for another episode because it's not really on topic as such but i've uh, vexed about this before uh i do think adventure game developers of now have a tendency to look back uh as opposed to looking forward i'm not sure there you know it's it's been in development forever so people can be excused but are there any ongoing Oculus Rift uh, adventure game projects? And if <laughs> if not, then why not? Adventure games were always about pushing the boundaries to try and tell a story. And I think it's kind of a shame that, that we would allow other genres to get a head start in basically everything. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. not saying that the... Uh, 1992 point and click style adventure doesn't have a lot going for it. It certainly has, but... but yeah. I, th- I think my way to end this would be uh, I second your point completely. Know your limitations, but don't be afraid of learning about them. Don't let anyone else tell you about your limitations. Learn exactly. about them yourself. Yeah, exactly. You would be surprised how many uh, you know quick cash grab survival horror games are on the Oculus Rift and roller coaster simulators. And that's a, apparently as far as they've thought with this brand, this grand, uh, grand, grand and brand um, VR technology. And it would be perfect for like exploration games like, uh, you know, Gone Home. And uh, what's that? What's the one where you are walking around trying to piece together this boy's murder? Um, Ethan something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Vanishing of Ethan Ethan Carter. Carter. Yeah. 
that that would that because that that thing looks gorgeous first of all that that that, that would i mean or, or a game like uh, like uh, augustin cordes's um, uh, asylum yeah. would look would look absolutely fantastic with the uh, with a vr helmet i, I, agree. I think so um yeah you you guys get on that everyone <laughs> yeah yeah you we we don't know how to code shit for the oculus rift but someone out there does so go for it yeah so anyway let's uh, let's call it quits shall we yeah this was uh an exhilarating I mean, I mean, I mean, time, it, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, call it quits for for today. We will be back next week, obviously. Yeah, yeah, no, and no one's dying. I mean, uh, <laughs> knock on wood well, except, here. Except except for my grandfather. <laughs> oh, that's uh, well. It's after dark, and we've officially gotten dark. So I guess what's left to say is that I'll see you next week, and Gareth will be with us uh, as well, of course. Yes, see it you, was man. a pleasure. It was a pleasure. See you. It guys. absolutely was. Take care. Bye. I will. Bye. Bye. I will. <laughs>